Well, and this is the fifth Sunday in Lent, so we are fast approaching. In fact, next Sunday is already Palm Sunday, and we'll get to Holy Week and uh, Easter already. So we are cruising along here um, as uh, we make our way to the cross and into the empty tomb. Um, I'm going to start out with the Old Testament lesson first from Jeremiah chapter 31. A very familiar words in Jeremiah, um, as, as we will read through them, um, that uh, familiar. But I just want to give you some little background history. Jeremiah um, lived um, about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. Um, and uh, he was there during the Babylonian captivity, um, at least the beginning of that. Jeremiah was the one that was sent by the Lord to warn the people that the captivity was going to happen and that uh, they, they needed to straighten up their ways, but they didn't, so that's what happened. So, uh, so Jeremiah was there when King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in, carted them away. Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem. Uh, he was not one of them, one of the captives who was, who was uh, carried away, uh, but he continued to write um, to the people who were in exile. Um, and uh, even in the midst of Jeremiah's warnings, the Lord's warnings, he did tell them that they would be coming back to the promised land. But it would be 70 years. Um, it would be a 70-year uh, span between when they left and then when, when God would bring them back. And um, in verse, all of chapter 31, the beginning of chapter 31, um, it's um, the, the, the Lord speaking through Jeremiah uh, telling them that, um, yes, you're going to Babylon, yes, you're not going to like it, but God's bringing you back. So that's kind of the, the gist there. And then we get to um, verse 31, uh, where uh, the Lord sets out this new way, this new covenant um, that we have. Um, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant uh, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the one uh, I made with them, uh, with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, we had the reading from Exodus 20, the, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So that first covenant that God makes with his people about, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of your slavery, out of your bondage in Egypt. Now I want you to do this. Um, and so um, by the time we get to Jeremiah, um, they have totally broken all those laws, all of them. Um, so much so that they, they didn't celebrate the Sabbath. They didn't celebrate Passover. I mean, they just forgot all those things that God says, I want you to do, but you're not doing them. And God warned them. God warned them. And so this is the, the covenant that I made with your fathers when I, that I'm from Egypt. So that he's talking about that first giving of the law. Um, and, and he uses the phrase, though I was, a, I was your husband. So this, this um, kind of the, the God says, um, I'm your husband and you're my wife. I'm going to love you with a never-ending love. I'm going to do everything I can. But um, Israel kept turning her back on God. In fact, there's a story of Haggai, and he had a wife named Gomer, and Gomer kept Gomer represented Israel, and she kept going to other men, kept sleeping with other people, uh, and God said, "This is the way it feels like. This is what it that when you go worship other gods, you're breaking my special covenant with you, my bond with you, and we're gonna go on your different way." So that's why God, that's why the Lord uses that phrase, uh, "Though I was a husband to you," uh, but in verse 33. This covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this new covenant that's going to come, that it's not going to be written just on stone like the Ten Commandments, but it will be written on people's hearts, on people's hearts. 
and then we're going to get to what exactly that means in a little bit here. But it's going to be it's going to be different um, than than before. And this whole verse thirty four and know the Lord. Uh, well, everybody will know because God's going to come to all people. Now, the word for know in Hebrew, I just want to point this, is it's you pronounce it yada. So, you know, whenever someone says something to you and you're going, like, you know, and you go, duh, it kind of goes back to the Hebrew, yada, I know that already. Um, and so this know the Lord and know the Lord personally, personally and intimately, like, like, not just kind of far away, kind of know God, but it's kind of I, you know the Lord, and and the and the bottom line will be that last sentence: for I will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. So when he's going to bring them back from ba- Babylon, he says, "I'm not going to bring that up." And then that also will apply to you and to me that when God forgives, He doesn't. Remember, he doesn't bring it up anymore. People have said, well, God can't forget. Yeah, it's not, he doesn't forget. He just chooses not to remember. He doesn't bring it up. So that's kind of what's going on there. So we have a new covenant that, that God is going to establish with his people. Now let's jump over to the gospel reading um, in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Um, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, um, and this first paragraph is what we call the third passion prediction. So this is the third time in Mark's gospel that he tells the disciples why they're going to Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, we had the first one when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. And if you remember, Peter said, no. And, and remember what Jesus called Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You have not in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Well, um, this is the third time. And, and listen to the response to the disciples this time. Just listen. And they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed as those who follow were afraid. They knew that when Jesus went in Jerusalem, that was enemy territory. They knew that there were people who wanted to end Jesus' life. But Jesus um, was just a man on a mission. Now, what's very interesting in Luke's gospel, in Luke 9, 51, this is kind of the turning point in Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem. In other words... He was a man on a mission. There was nothing that was going to stop him from doing what he said he was going to do. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. So he's kind of, and they're all going, Jesus, why are we, why are we going there? Let, let's, let's avoid, let's avoid this area at all costs, Jesus. We'll just stay up here and we'll establish a kingdom up here. But Jesus is, we're going. And it's like, come on, let's go. I mean, he is, they're kind of, really? We really don't want to go. And so, um, and then taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. Remember, going up, is the, it was higher. It's the highest mountain in the area. Uh, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to get the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Every time that Jesus gives this passion prediction, he gives more details as to what's going to happen. He's almost naming names here as to what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the chief priests and the scribes. Well, they knew who that was. They knew those guys by names. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans. Oh, Pontius Pilate. And then he says, they're going to spit on me, they're going to flog me, they're going to kill me. And then that last sentence, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. They seem to have forgotten that when we get to Easter, that they will forget that little phrase. So this is what's going on. Now, before, the disciples go, no, why would you want to do that, Jesus? Now here, well, let's just hear what, what, the, what, what uh, Mark says here. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. 
He said to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I, w- which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. So I want to stop there. So, in response to Jesus saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, die, rise again, what does James and John want? They want an earthly kingdom. They want, I, Jesus, uh, just... We're going to ask you just one thing, a little just a minor little, uh, we just want to sit in your left and your right. In other words, you're number one, Jesus, but we're two and three. We're two and three. And Jesus goes, you have no, did you just hear what I said? I'm thinking he's probably going to get, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die. I'm going to enter into glory, but the glory will be on the cross. And are you able to drink that cup? Now, in the, that's an Old Testament phrase. To say that you drink from the cup of the Lord in some aspects, meaning you're going to receive God's wrath, that God's going to bring judgment upon you, that, that judgment is going to come. Um, there's, uh, in Psalm, I think Psalm 22, which is a psalm for Good Friday, it says, and I drank... Uh, the cup all the way to the dregs. I mean, I drank it all. I mean, I, I mean, I even drank the stuff that was in the bottom. You know, when you drink your coffee and you get the little grounds, even drank that with that. And then this whole baptism, while there's not specific references in the Old Testament to being a baptism of fire, we think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here, that, that you're going to enter into my death. Now, we do know that Paul mentions in Romans chapter 6, since we have been therefore buried with him in baptism, we will also rise. And so Jesus is saying, um, what, I, what, what you need to do, guys, is that you're going to pick up your cross and you're going to follow me. You're going to put to death all earthly desires. Now, we do know that, that James do, is martyred. He's the first of the disciples that are martyred in the book of Acts. So he's going to die for the faith. John is the only one that lives and dies of of natural death. The rest of the disciples, all are martyred. So when they say, we can do that, Jesus, they had no idea what they were talking about. They had no idea. I found out later, as they all did. So so we we have this. And And then Jesus says, who can sit on my left and my right is not up for me to determine. I can't do that. That's already been chosen. That's already, I can't. So they want to be number one and number two in, in what they think is the earthly kingdom, the glory that they want. But Jesus is saying it's not going to be what you think it is. And then, verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be, and I'm going to use a word that we often use today, they were offended (laughs) at James and John. Why would they be indignant? Why would they be offended? Why do you think that is? Because they thought they were better than the rest of them. They're going, why didn't we think of that first? (laughs) We we should have talked to Jesus first. What, James and John, Really? We would be better at the job. So they're, they're you know, indignant. And, and Jesus is watching them, and, and, and he says to them, you know that those who, considered, uh, who are considered rulers of the Gentile lord it over them? And their greatest ones exercise authority over them. So they're thinking greatness in the kingdom of God is people serving under me. That's, I mean, that even is today, you know, who greatness is, oh, it's how many people do I, you know, am I over, whatever that is. But then Jesus says, it shall not be so among you that whoever would be great among you must be your servant, 
and whoever must be first among you must be the slave of all. For Je the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus totally turns things upside down. He says, you want glory? Glory is found in serving others, loving them, uh, putting yourself under them, um, because that's what I'm doing for you. And he talks about the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And Jesus continues to serve us. He serves us in the sacraments, tells us our sins are forgiven, so that he continues to, to take care of us. I mean, all the uh, spiritual gifts that we have, all the material gifts that we have, that all comes from God, all comes from Jesus. Um, and, and we know that, and Jesus says, um, you know, I came to give my life as a ransom. Well, what is a ransom? When, when you hear the ransom, what do you think of? Money. It's money. And usually you pay a ransom, why? Somebody been kidnapped. Yeah, someone else is being held captive, and that's the ransom that to set them free. So Jesus says, and, and remember a couple weeks ago, we had, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of your bondage your slavery in Egypt. I did that. We said, for us, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of your sin slavery and your bondage. And Jesus did that by his ransom, by his suffering and death on the cross. And so it kind of goes back to why is Jesus going to do this? Why is he going to put himself under the chief priests and the scribes and the Gentiles and allow all this to happen so that we could be ransomed, so that we could be set free, so that we would no longer have to serve under Satan and his reign, and that we have freedom in Christ, and that we are his children. So we, we have this, you know, shift. Now, we also, because we are little Christs and been baptized into Jesus, we too do what we do what Jesus did, and we serve one another. We put ourselves under others and serve them and love them. Um, we're not co so concerned as how many people are under us. It's how can we help and serve one another. I know you know all that, but that just because that will help in understanding the epistle reading that we get to in Hebrews chapter five. And if you want to make your way over there, uh, yes. This John is the same one that wrote Revelation. Correct. Yes, it's the, one of the first disciples of Jesus. He wrote the gospel according to John. He wrote 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, oh, and, yeah. and the book of Revelation. So, and this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Correct. He always refers to himself in his own disciple. He never calls himself by name, but it's always the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the one where Jesus is at the cross, and he sees his mom, and he says, Oh, behold your mother, John. Oh, behold your son, you know. That's the, that's the John. Um, so that's what that is. Now, the book of Hebrews. Uh, we don't know who the writer is, the author of the book of Hebrews. There's many guesses. Some say Paul, maybe. There's a lot of Paul-isms in the letter, but it could be Apollos. But Paul, when he would write, he would make reference to himself in his letters. So that's why we're saying, maybe not Paul. Apollos was one of Paul's companions early on. We don't know. It's one of those questions when I get to heaven, I will ask, who's the writer to the Hebrews? Of course, when I get there, I probably won't care anymore, but we'll find out. Now, the book of Hebrews, the general uh, kind of theme of the book of Hebrews is understanding the Old Testament worship practices and, and saying how Jesus fulfilled them all how Jesus uh, has done it all so that we don't have to do those sacrifices anymore. We're not under the old covenant where we have to do those sacrifices. You know, we would bring the, the goat or the lamb or the pigeon or the grain offering or the drink offering and in order to, to uh, make atonement for our sins. Um, the writer of Hebrews is saying that's, that Jesus did that all. He is, he's the one that did that. And, and we're going to hear him talk about how Jesus is the high priest, but he's also the sacrifice 
So he's the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but he's also the high priest that makes that happen. Now, um, how the Old Testament worship practices were set up is that um, you were to go to the priest to, to have the sacrifice done. And the priest and the high priest were picked among the people. Now, they're all from the family line of Aaron. They're all related to Aaron, Moses' brother, because that's what God said. Um, but there's also, um, there was also this other high priest that shows up in Genesis. His name is Melchizedek. And he just kind of shows up, talks to Abraham, and then he leaps. We're going, well, who's that? And why, why, is, why is this here? It's like, those, like the, the story of the people being bit by the snake. You know, last week you're going, well, what does that have to do with anything? I mean, and then Jesus makes it, oh, that's, I know that is, that's Jesus. So we got this other, um, you know, you have the high priest from Aaron's line, but you have the priest of Melchizedek from, the, from, from Salem. Salem, Jerusalem, Salem, peace. So we'll get into that a little bit more. So this is what the Hebrew writer, the writer of Hebrew says. Every high priest was chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So God chose Aaron, and then all the priests and the high priests were chosen from that line. So by the time we get to Jesus, um, Caiaphas and Ananias, they were, they were descendants of Aaron. So was, if you remember earlier, Zechariah and Elizabeth, because they were doing... Zechariah was doing priestly duties, so he was from the line of Aaron. So that's that line that, that the writer's writing here. He says, He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weaknesses. In other words, um, that the priest would confront people who were, who were, you know, were being sinful and saying, you, you need to stop that. You, need, you, can't, you shouldn't do that anymore. You, need to, you make atonement for your sins. Because of this, he was obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So that's, that's, that, that priestly line is of Aaron. Verse 5. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, was, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that you are my son, today I have begotten you, that's from Psalm 2, verse 7. Also, it's what God said to Jesus when he's being baptized. You are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. It's, it's a, a quote from Psalm 2. Now, Psalm 2 was read when kings and priests were consecrated to do their office. So um, they would read the entirety of Psalm 2. That was the coronation uh, psalm. It was also done when priests were anointed to be priests. So you are my son, I, I begotten you. Then also, uh, the second one, you are a priest forever from, after the order of Melchizedek. That's from Psalm 110, verse 4. So we have Melchizedek shown up in Genesis 18, somewhere in there. And if you remember that, that was after uh, Abraham saves his nephew Lot um, um, from uh, the big cheese king, Cheddar Lamor, the big cheese Cheddar Lamor. <laughs> Just a joke, whatever. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so he's coming back, and he runs into this priest called Melchizedek from Salem. And Abraham gives him a tenth, Melchizedek gives a tenth of everything he has. So he, he uh, gives him a tenth, and, and uh, Melchizedek offers him um, food, bread, and wine. Hmm. Hmm. And the question is, Who's Melchizedek? Hmm. The 
pre-incarnate Christ, the Jesus before he's born Jesus. And so when it says, you are priest for after the order of Melchizedek, there's the Aaron line, which had a beginning. Melchizedek, he was just, he showed up out of nowhere, so he's a priest forever. And so Jesus is from the line of Melchizedek. Jesus is not a descendant of Aaron. He's a descendant of Judah. Now, we do know, well, I shouldn't say he's not a descendant of Aaron. He does have some Aaron blood from him, and it has to be from his mother's line because it can't be from Joseph. So you go back, you see that Jesus has some Aaron blood in him, that, that part of the family tree. But here, it's more important that we have Melchizedek, who gives the gift to, Aaron, to Abraham, the, the bread and the cup, the wine. Not the cup of wrath, but the cup of friendship, the cup of peace. And so um, we, we have that. Now, what does a priest do? What's the job of the priest in the Old Testament? I kind of gave you one thing. He made the, sacrifice. made the sacrifices. What else did the priest do? What do pastors do for their people? Forgive their, Forgive their sins and pray for them. So you, you got this priest doing, praying for them, sacrifice, teaching, preaching, all that kind of stuff. We would say pastors do. Um, and, and so we have that going on. So we have the old covenant uh, sacrifices for sins, but didn't really take care of it all because people are still sinful because so they, they didn't have the perfect sacrifice. And the priest was also sinful. So you got to have a priest that's without sin performing the perfect sacrifice in order for sins to be forgiven. So we're seeing this going from the old covenant to the new covenant as Jeremiah talks about. And so we, we have that going on. Now, the, the new high priest, the high priest, meaning Jesus the high priest, the writer says this is what he did. In the days of his flesh, meaning his earthly ministry, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his, because of his reverence. So Jesus prayed. We read this all the time. He goes away and prays. That's what he's doing. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying so much that he's sweating drops of blood. He's crying out if there's any other way. Any other way, Father? Nope. Okay. Not my will, but your will be done. So we, we have that going on. We have Jesus crying from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God doesn't answer. But then Jesus says, it is finished. So he's, he's saying, it's all done. Amen. No more needs to be done in order to be saved. Verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the question is, what does the writer Hebrews mean, mean that he was made perfect? What does that mean? I mean, we use the English word perfect here. It's a bad translation of the word. But he's, already it, sinless in the he's already sinless. But when it says he was made perfect, in other words, when he had fulfilled all he had to do. Or as I like to say, when Jesus says, it is finished, all was accomplished. It was done. It was completed. That when Jesus did this, no more do we need to offer sacrifices for our sins. No more are we going to sit there and wonder, was this enough? Did, did, did this sacrifice, did it do enough? Or what about the priest? Did he do a sacrifice in order to have his sins covered? We, this new covenant, as Jeremiah talks about, Jesus did it all, and it says he's after the line of Melchizedek. The perfect priest. The, the priest from all eternity. And, and Jesus being the high priest performed the perfect sacrifice, and then Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So he was the priest and the sacrifice at the same time. You know, so, so we have that going on. So we have this wonderful, you know, here's the new covenant. I don't have to wonder about, did, did I sacrifice enough? Did I believe enough? Jesus did it all. 
He was the perfect sacrifice. All I do is trust that Jesus did it all, and he did. And then we can hold on to that. What a great comfort that is for us. All right? Well, we're making great time. Let's jump. Any questions on that? Jump over to the intro on the back page. Um, fifth Sunday in Lent, uh, the, the old, does anybody remember what they called the fifth Sunday in Lent? The old, what they called it? U- Utica, U- it means to judge or here to vindicate, to, to declare what's right. Um, and so, um, you know, vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. Um, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he's inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffer distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul, for you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. Glory be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. Now, what's very interesting that when we read this, um, Jesus read these same words. I mean, this Jesus could say these. God the Father, vindicate me. You, you know where I am. Plead my cause. Plead my case. And he says, I love the Lord. I, I've done everything, and I called out to him, and he's delivered me. So you got, David originally wrote this, and then you got Jesus reading this, and then there's us. God, vindicate me. Stand up for what is right. And against those who are accusing me, tell them they're wrong. Because why? I love you because you, all, you did this all for me. We can say we live under the new covenant, that Jesus was the high priest, who performed the perfect sacrifice, and he was the sacrifice for our sins so that we don't have to wonder whether or not we're getting into heaven or not. It's already given to us. We just just say, oh, yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, And so, and he does deliver us all the time. Every time we confess our sins, I announce that your sins are forgiven. There's deliverance. There comes salvation. And so that's, you know, that's what that is. We always run back to what Jesus has done for us. Always what Jesus has done for us. And then the intro it. <clears throat> Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You know, your great goodness, your merciful goodness that you would govern us, guide us, and lead us, and you preserve us. And that's what he does. As we are reminded, we are under the new covenant that Jesus did it all for us. We just trust, believe, faith, and even that's given to us, that that we endure, even though the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh would, would want us to doubt that, would want us to be in disbelief that Jesus did that all for us. Because we are sinful, terrible human beings. Because that's, that's who we are. But Jesus says, I love you anyways. I did this anyways for you. Thanks be to God. Which is a great thing. Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.